I was chatting with a friend recently, a new parent, who was describing some of the ways their lives had been turned upside down by this little miracle. And he said, it's so hard. Nobody told us it would be this hard. And we laughed, but then I was like, are you sure? Because I think they did. I think you just didn't know what those words meant yet. So many times in my life, I thought I knew something, even had all the right words to describe it. But then I fully experienced it. And it was like, oh, it's like this. And they were the same words. (laughs) But suddenly they'd become real. Now I actually knew, not just in my head, but in my bones. See, in life, whether it's parenting or love or grief or struggle, we don't really know the things we think we know until we've lived them. Because we don't know by knowing. We come to know by doing. And faith is the same. And the scary truth is that we could come to church our whole lives, do all the Christian-looking things, say all the Christian-sounding words, know all kinds of things about God, but never truly know God intimately within. In the book of Matthew, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says that some will be surprised when he turns to them and says, I never knew you. Now, there's a world of difference between knowledge in your head versus an experiential knowing in your spirit. Now, one barely touches your life. The other one leaves virtually nothing untouched in your life. All this month, we've been talking about what faith is and isn't. And this morning, the reminder is that true faith is not in your head. It's not in theory. Real faith is embodied. It's in our footsteps, in what we actually do. Because we don't know by knowing, we come to know by doing which is why we talk so often about spiritual practices, which simply means the behaviors that we engage in to experience a a deep and dynamic interactive relationship with God, the practices that pattern our footsteps. But that doesn't mean that we're trying to force spiritual transformation by our own white knuckle efforts. No, it means we enter into a practice-based faith of contemplative spirituality, where we learn the skills and develop the muscles to continually place ourselves into a posture where we're likely to experience the grace and love and the presence of God, which are always present. But it's about learning how to become more present to that which is already present to us. So we don't make the water, so to speak. Yet we learn how to place ourselves beneath the tap where water is likely to flow. You know, trusting the experienced presence of God to be the thing that changes any and everything that needs changing in us. In Philippians, Paul captures this symbiotic relationship well. Therefore, my dear friends, continue to work out your salvation with awe and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, work out your salvation, For it is God who works in you. Now, it's not about performed goodness. It's about learning to tap into a life source that is so holy and completely good that the more we come to know that, we cannot help but overflow goodness naturally from who we are becoming. And then our footsteps become like Jesus. And that takes practice, active, experimental, continually stretching practice, which is why we on Sundays are constantly exposing you to a variety of practices designed to draw us out of our comfort zones and into the growth zone, which can feel awkward at times, I know, especially if you've brought a non-church friend to church. But honestly, leaning into them for real is what unleashes the real. And every single person who comes into this space on a Sunday morning is looking for real, if nothing else. Aren't we? So sometimes those practices feel good and we enjoy them. And sometimes they feel hard and not enjoyable at all. And the truth is, we need both ends of that spectrum. 
There are some really core foundational practices that spur reliable growth. And there are a million auxiliary practices and creative ways to experience God that you haven't even met yet. So find the practices that your wiring loves and practice them deeply, daily. Was it worship, the Bible, breath prayers, serving people, making art, tending garden? You know, where have you felt God in the past? Find what sparks and practice it regularly and that spark will become self-perpetuating. And we do need a bunch of the practices that we don't love at all, but that teach us how to empty ourselves, train us for surrender, that develop in us the Jesus muscles that we don't have yet. We need discomfort if we're going to grow, in part because you don't actually know all the ways you're wired yet. You might start out hating one practice and two minutes or two weeks or two months later discover it's one of the best for you. But even when that doesn't happen, we deeply need those practices, fasting, repentance, forgiveness, because that is the way of the cross. And death paves the way for resurrection. I'll tell you the practice that is both hardest and best for me personally, and that's practicing Sabbath. I find it hard to set aside the needs of work and the noise of the world for an entire day to simply rest and delight and say that God's goodness is enough. And it's without a doubt the practice that both sustains and spurs new life inside of me that resurrects me again and again more than any other. And still I fight it, I resist it, I neglect it. I say, I'm gonna skip just this once and six weeks go by. And it is life. There's no sense to it, except that I am stubbornly human. And this is the struggle. You know, truly knowing God is mysterious and hard and wild and wonderful. And you were made for this. It just takes practice. And so that's actually what we're going to spend the rest of this service doing. Not talking about practices, but practicing the presence of God. We're going to follow three basic movements. First, looking inward. Then we'll shift our focus upward. And finally, we will turn our gaze outward. Ready?